Everyone can hear me? All right. We'll begin by sitting in a comfortable, steady position. See if you can this morning. Feel your sit bones firmly into your chair or seat. And where you can, lift up from your low belly. And maybe just gently puff the chest forward. Then soft and slow, allow your hands to come down onto your thighs. And relax your shoulders down from your ears. See if you can bring awareness to the center of the belly and allow the breath to come from here, the lowest portion of your belly. Breathe in soft and slow and breathe out relaxing and calming. Now, keeping this centered attention on your breath, uh, focus on the low belly still. Just gently look upward. Allow your gaze to follow an arc upward until your chin is high into the air. Make certain there isn't any pressure on the back side of your neck. Keep the breathing soft and relaxed. On the next exhale, we'll start to lower the chin. Remember, attention is still on the low belly. The spine is long and the shoulders are relaxed. And soft and slow, the chin will come as if it's going to touch your chest. Be careful not to round the neck, though. Just bow your head gently. Soft and slow breathing. On the next inhale, bring the head, back, the head back to neutral. And this time, gently tilt the head sideways to your left. It's as if your ear were going to come down to your left shoulder. Notice if the right shoulder goes high in the air. And if it does, just bring it down softly. And come center with the head and take the ear to the opposite side, gentle and slow, calm and relaxed. When you come center this time, see if you can breathe out a little more strongly and bring your belly inward almost as if you were going to touch your belly to the spine. And then soft and relaxed in the belly. Let's do this two more times. Exhale, the belly soft towards the spine, and then stronger yet. When you inhale, you relax it. Last time, Belly inward. And relax softly on the inhale. Now coming back to center, we'll begin the lecture. Namaste once again, everyone. Good morning. 
Now in lecture three, we learned asanas for each vayu. And if you would, just give me some of the values and maybe an asana for one of the values as well. You choose. You can choose maybe um, Udana Vayu and then give me a, an asana for that one. What would it be for Udana Vayu? Samana would be twist. Prana, Surya Namaskar. Now remember from Nicole's you say cat cow. Good. Now remember, we want to use basic postures. And what's basic? That's hard to determine, isn't it? Sometimes um, Surya Namaskara isn't very basic for most people. Even with teachers, when I'm training teachers that have taught for several years, I find that even teachers have a hard time keeping alignment in their own practice in something that should be second place, the sun salutation. So giving sun salutation for yoga therapy will probably be few and far between. Udana, sasana, sasasana, yes, the rabbit, very good. So you want to keep within uh, the postures or the asanas that we've reviewed, and even though as you move on into your yoga therapy and your Ayurvedic practice, you'll expand your repertoire of asanas. Start with the ones that we review in lecture and work just with these for the purposes of this class. And then again, Balasana for Udana. That's good. Thank you, everyone. So remember, yoga therapy is aimed, of course, to balance the values. Another aim, of course, is to balance Agni. So today our focus will be asanas for Agni. So Agni is responsible for digestion and metabolism. When Agni is not functioning properly, food does not digest. And undigested food is Ama, as you all know. Ama causes fermentation and putre putrefaction in the stomach, and then as a result, disease occurs. Now, we could have a whole class just on Agni, but this is beyond the scope of, of yoga therapy, and so we're going to leave Agni just uh, within this context. In other words, Agni is responsible for digestion and metabolism. In your other classes, of course, you will focus uh, on Agni separately. So when the digestive system is healthy, when Agni is healthy, we are vital, we have plenty of energy, we have clear skin and eyes. The mind is clear, we're happy, free from headaches, stress, and tension. Today we're going to focus on four stages of Agni. Vishama Agni, which is Vata Dosha Dominant. Tikshna Agni, which is Pitta Dosha Dominant. Manda Agni, Kapha Dosha Dominant. And Sama Agni, which is balanced, of course. I see a couple of you aren't muted. If maybe Anhal and the call-in user can mute. Also, Gretchen, can you mute? Let's see if I can help you. OK. So of course, yoga asanas, pranayama and meditation, work to stabilize Agni by virtue of stimulating, pacifying, and balancing Agni at a higher level than medication. I say this because at a higher level than medication because 
oftentimes you will have a client who is on medication, say for acid reflux or maybe even constipation, uh, different digestive disorders. And you'll find that by using asanas, pranayama, and meditation, that people can come off of the medication. And of course, true healing is when you're free of medication and you're able to uh, have health, balanced health. And so I use this term, a higher level, meaning that uh, we get a more complete or a true healing quality, I feel, with asanas, pranayama, and meditation uh, than you do with medication. So there's a classical text of yoga called the Hatha Yoga Pratapika. This text was written or compiled around the 15th century. The work is compiled mostly from uh, older Sanskrit texts and by Swami Swatmara's own yogic experiences. It's really a great book. It tells or it reviews things on the practice of Hatha Yoga, where you should practice, what kind of a room, what kind of breathing you should do, um, uh, when you should bathe before or after practice, should you practice in the wind or in the sun. It's really a beautiful book. It's rather dense uh, in many ways. It's a thick book. And it's sometimes it can be a little bit uh, difficult to process. But I think it'd be well worth uh, getting and reviewing and using it as a reference as time moves on. During our lecture today, we'll be focusing on this text and um, its recommendations for asana. So the Hatha Yoga Pratapika gives us yoga practices, as I've just said, and but which stimulate and pacify and balance Agni. Nicole says it has some very strange practices. Well, remember, strange is what? Something that we're not accustomed to. So I'm going to say yes, no, maybe so to that one. You know, when I first read Hatha Yoga Pratapika, I might have said, wow, some of these things are strange or, or different intense or weird or this, that, and the other. But as I've practiced over the years, I found myself using um, many of the practices or many of the postures described in the text. So now it's not too strange for me. So you would say extreme. <laughs> I'm not fighting with you, Nicole. But here again, I'd say, well, what is extreme? And who can handle extreme? Um, some yogis are very adept, the ascetic yogis who are off in the mountains practicing. They're, sometimes they're called the men of ash uh, because they rub ash on their bodies to stay warm and go deep up into the Himalayas and uh, practice. Is that extreme? Well, no, not for them. Is it extreme for me? Maybe. Is it extreme for others? Well, maybe yes. So we have to be um, careful in the way we use words that we don't influence our clients. Uh, we have to make certain that we don't make a judgment based on our experience and then transfer that on to our clients. Remember, one of the first um, tenets of Krishnamacharya, one of the first pillars of Krishnamacharya is to teach to the individual. And that means that we can't bring our own experience into it or our own judgment into into it, we have to be completely objective of the practice. And the only way to be objective of the practice and to help others heal is to not judge it. So it, it uh, Titi Basana, that pose I showed you where I'm in the firefly balancing on the rock, that seems extreme to some. To me, it's not extreme at all. And remember, that would be a basic pose for me. So I appreciate your comments and continue to comment. I like your honesty. But remember, working within the context of, of healing or helping others, we have to be careful not to show um, any judgment or any coloring because we'll sway others very quickly. Why? Because we're in the seat of position or we're in a seat of authority. People will honor our opinions just because we're Ayurvedic practitioners or just because we're yoga therapists. And we have to take that uh, seat very seriously 
and be mindful and aware of the words and the communication that we have with our clients. So using words like extreme or strange or odd or different may not be a good thing uh, because we want people to be open to this practice. And the practice is already, I'll admit, it's very different because it is a Western. So convincing people to do things that aren't Western is going to be a chore in itself. So we'll have to be careful to choose our words wisely and not put people at a distance just by the words that we use. Is that fair? So we'll move on. So Vibhanga or constipation is a vata dosha imbalance. You all know that it comes mostly from eating light or airy food, uh, from improper daily routine, and maybe even from inadequate stress management. Constipation can uh, ruin someone's life in many ways. It's said to cause headaches and, of course, distension, discomfort. Uh, not a very good thing to have on a chronic basis, even if you have it just every now and then, constipation isn't a good thing, right? So here we move on with yoga therapy. What is going to help constipation? Well, the Hatha Yoga Product Pika, Chapter 1, Verse 27 says, The practice of Matsya and Drasana, and you all know what that is now, which stimulates Jasaragni, is a weapon to destroy the diseases around the umbilicus. It bestows upon those persons who practice it arousal of kundalini and stability of the mind. So arousal of the energy within the belly. So asanas for visham agni or constipation would be vajrasana. Vajrasana is the hero pose. Many of you know it. It's sitting on your heels with bent knees. Now, I'll use the word extreme. This can be an extreme pose for some people, and it may not be a basic pose, one that you'll have to choose wisely in giving to your clients because, of course, knee problems could cause, uh, you could damage the knees even further if they have knee problems or injuries, recent injuries. But if people have um, Injury-free knees, and they're fairly flexible. The hero pose would be excellent for constipation because with the bend of the knees, this causes extra blood in the stomach for digestion. Uh, it comes from the reduction of blood circulation in the lower part of the belly because the knees are bent forward like this. The capacity of the various glands connected to the digestion process increases, and indigestion and gas formation is decreased. And you remember, of course, Palanukasana, the holding into the knees posture. Here the abdominal muscles are flexed or contracted gently, and the internal organs are compressed, which increases blood circulation and stimulates the nerves, increasing the efficiency of the internal organs, and this relieves the constipation. Uh, Nicole asks, would I use a block for knee problem? Well, Nicole, that's a good uh, question. Now, remember, if I were teaching you as a yoga teacher, definitely 100%. Use a block to relieve the compression in the knees. This is for a yoga class. Now, remember, we're talking about yoga therapy. And in yoga therapy, we're going to be using one to three postures. And the postures must be done in a way that have extreme attention to alignment and extreme attention to um, uh, putting the body in the, in the place so that the desired effect will occur. So... If you have a block and you're six inches off the air, are you going to reduce the blood circulation in the lower part of the body? Well, I'm kind of thinking that's a yes, no, maybe so again. And I'm also thinking that's probably not going to help with the constipation. So I would use Vajrasana, the hero pose, for those without knee problems. 
for constipation. If they have knee problems, you can put a block in, but then that's not going to help the constipation because you don't have the strong restriction or the strong reduction of the blood circulation in the lower part of the belly because you've lifted up uh, the torso off the ground and you've taken that effect out. Does that make sense, everyone? So remember, our goal isn't to, to make it so they can do the pose, which that would be our goal in, in a yoga class if I were teaching, teaching yoga teachers. I would say, well, how can we make adjustments so that everyone can do this pose? And then I would show you all the different adjustments that we could use so everyone in a class of 15, 20, 30 could do the same pose. That's not the case in yoga therapy. Yoga therapy, it's highly individual, and I'm only going to give the student poses that they can do that they can be steady and comfortable in. If they aren't comfortable in Vajrasana, guess what? They don't get the pose. Everyone can do Pawan Muktasana, then they get Pawan Muktasana. Pawan Muktasana gives the same effects, and we don't have to worry about the knees. Okay? So anlapita, anlapita is hyperacidity. It's characterized by burning in the throat and the chest. It has symptoms of vomiting sometimes, sour taste in the mouth, brought on by carbonated drinks, hot or, hot or spicy foods, sleeping late in anger. So of course, it's primarily a pitta dosha imbalance. The Hatha Yoga Pratapika, chapter one, verse 27 says, Pashimottanasana is foremost among the asanas. It directs the passage of prana along the back. It balances jatharagni, reduces the belly, and bestows health upon the aspirants. Now, last lecture we talked about Pashimottanasana. And remember, in my view, Pashimottanasana isn't basic. And here I'm going to go back to it and say, if you can do Pashimottanasana with the belly on the thighs, now, that doesn't mean with a rounded belly and a rounded back. I mean, really, with the belly button touching the thighs, then you get the benefit. If you cannot do Pashimottanasana, for how long? Yoga therapy is good if practiced one minute a day, consistently every day. Now. If the client has more time, three minutes, five minutes, 15 minutes, very good, then they do it longer. But guess what? One minute is all you need, but it has to be consistent. So if you have a client that can almost get into Pashimottanasana with the back straight, the belly on the thighs, but they're not quite there touching the belly to the thighs, haven't been the knees. Because I'm not worried about stretching the hamstrings, what I want to do is I want to make certain that there's a direct passage of prana along the back, along Shashumna Nadi. Remember, we'll talk about Shashumna Nadi next lecture during our pranayama lecture. But long story short, if I can kind of massage my belly on my thighs and keep my spine long, Pashimottanasana is the pose for me. If I can't keep the spine long, I can't keep the belly on my thighs, Pashimottanasana isn't the one for me, even if it says so in the Hatha Yoga Pratapika. Nicole asks for how long. I always like to say start with a minute, just with everyone, because then you won't have anyone um, bucking it, you know, trying to say, no, I can't do it. I don't have time. I forgot. All you do is say, you have a minute every day, don't you? Of course, everyone has a minute. I even tell people, time it. I want you to put your watch right there and just time it for a minute. And then, of course, they start feeling silly. They think, well, I can do a minute. Certainly, I can do two. And without you having to ask them to do two minutes, they do two minutes. So always start very small. Don't start with five minutes or 10 minutes or 10 postures or 20 postures. One posture one minute. That's yoga therapy, specific to the individual, working on the specific issue, consistent over a long period of time, 
and I've had very good benefits with very many clients. I don't know if I've mentioned my client uh, to you who's 86 years old. I've worked with him since he was 74 years old. 74 he started. And when he was started uh, with me, he couldn't uh, walk without shuffling the feet. He was hobbled over like an old man. He had pain in his shoulders. He was a World War II vet and had shoulders who were very much damaged. And his knees would buckle. His legs would spasm if I would hold him and stretch for any amount of time. And his breath was short and labored. Well, he had a lot of anxiety and he was very depressed. He really felt like he wanted to die. He was a long time widow widower. His wife had died when he was only 45 years old. She had died of breast cancer. Well, this client of mine, I call him my favorite client, my best client, because he does everything I ask of him. I say, now breathe in and hold the breath and see if he cannot wrinkle your face, because he'll wrinkle his face up and act like he's complaining. And he'll soften his face up. And I'll say, breathe out. Really feel it. What I'm saying is he does it with the utmost of, of wanting and caring and awareness. It, it's really beautiful. Well, long story short, over these last 12 years, he walks with ease. He has no pain in his shoulders. Uh, he's no longer depressed. It's been a complete transformation of this man. He says now that yoga has changed his life. Sometimes he'll say, I changed his life. And I said, I didn't do the work, Bill. You did the work. So what I'm trying to say is if you give the right postures, you don't pressure people to, here, put a block under, here, do this. You know, just give what they can take. But give it consistently. Bill has been doing it every Tuesday, Thursday for 12 years. He never misses. And if I ask him to do a thing, a breathing, a stretch, he does it. And he does it with, with, with the utmost of care and awareness and, and with great effort, just like the sutra says we should. I'm sure over time you'll hear more stories about Bill, because I think if an 86-year-old man can do it, we can too. He's the man, remember I've told this story to some of you, that lost 30 pounds when he was 83. And he's homebound. He came to me and he says, I'm going to do Weight Watchers. And I say, Bill, don't do Weight Watchers. Let me help you. And all I did was practice the yamas and niyamas with him. And guess what? He lost 30 pounds just by becoming aware of what he's eating. So, that said, let's go back to our Amna Pitta. So, Asanas for Tikshna Agni in general, and of course, Amna Pitta as well, includes Setu Bandhasana, or the bridge. It's a gentle stretch for the front of the body. It aids Tikshna Pitta by bringing soft awareness to the belly and back without effort. Everyone can do Setu Bandhasana, Setu Bandhasana. Now, this is a good one for Pitta because most of the time Pittas are trying to overwork. This one will bring attention to the belly without pushing and straining because the last thing we want it's uh, pitta aggravation to strain and push anymore. So this is just comfortable, steady, relaxed. And then, again, if you ask for how long, remember a posture you can hold that's comfortable and steady, we can hold forever, can't we? And I'll tell you another quick story. A few years ago, I went to uh, India for the first time, and I went to ashram and stayed Good experience, wonderful experience. Beside that, we were practicing yoga and the uh, asana yoga, and the teachers put us in bakasana, the arm balance. 
And I don't know if he forgot, but I didn't look around the room or anything, but I just kept thinking and breathing and counting how many breaths we were in the Bakasana pose. My breaths are pretty slow. I think they probably take me about 15 seconds, I'm thinking, to breathe inward and to breathe outward in a pose. Well, I stayed in this pose for 64 breaths. <laughs> And I thought to myself, I kept thinking in my head, okay, I can stay for another breath. I can stay for another breath. And then finally the teacher said, okay, come out of the pose. So what I'm saying, how long should you stay in pose? As long as you can stay where it's comfortable. Most people in American society, though, they don't have time to stay in pose. So just give them a minute to start. So we'll move on to twists for Tikshna Agni. Twists are invigorating for the internal organs. Now remember, while twists are beneficial, it's important to keep twists soft for pittas, as excessive twisting or poor alignment can work counter to the intended effect. Remember, upright twists or seated twists, standing twists, 99.9% .9 of people do not perform properly. That's why I feel for yoga therapy, it's really important to give reclining twists so that the spine is supported and there's no propensity for them hurting the back and or going too deeply into the pose without proper warm up or cool down. Remember yoga therapy, we normally do not give a, a, a warm up or a cool down. It's just the pose. So we have to make certain that the pose isn't intense. Stalia, obesity. The word obesity is derived from Latin word obesis, which means to eat. Obesity is characterized by excess amount of fat under the skin and around the internal organs. Um, they say now that 60% of Americans are obese. This is alarming. It seems that overeating, irregular eating habits, and the intake of fatty foods, sugary foods, and a sedentary lifestyle cause obesity. Sometimes imbalances in the thyroid, pituitary, and sex glands can contribute to obesity. Now, the Hatha Yoga Pradipika says, Mayarasana kindles jatharagni and completely digests all the unwholesome and overeaten food, even poison. Now, Mayarasana is, I'm going to use Nicole's word, here I go, Nicole, it's extreme for some people. Now, if you would like to go on the yoga therapy uh, module online, I have three sequences. I call them beginner, intermediate, advanced. It's really where Vata, Pitta, Kappa should be. I have variations for Mayarasana. It's basically a dolphin on your elbows and forearms. Okay? Mayarasana is the peacock, the elbow and forearm inversion. Not too many people can be comfortable in this pose. If you want to give this posture to a kapha person or someone who is struggling with obesity, just use the version of dolphin, where they're on their elbows and forearms and down dog legs. They don't have to bring the legs up all the way into a complete inversion to get the benefit. So yes, Sandio College of Ayurveda says that's so hard, Mayarasana. Now listen, remember, kapas are going to be the most difficult to work with. Most things are going to be difficult for them. So what are you going to give them? You're going to give them poses that are not difficult. So maybe until they get stronger in the mind and the body, you give them Matsi and Drasana instead. So you just choose your poses wisely. Choose the pose to the individual. And then, of course, as time progresses, you'll give different poses. 
So maybe my arasana will be one you'll give to someone who's been with you for 12 years. <laughs> okay? So asanas for mandagni. Vajrasana, again, we go back to the hero. We already talked about that. This is the only posture that should and can be performed after meals. Can be performed after meals. Usually you want to leave at least an hour and preferably three hours after meals before doing posture. This one you can do it directly after. Why? Because it will produce a reduction of blood in the lower extremities and kindle up just our agni or put extra blood in the in the belly to process the food and and fire it. Huh? Now, Navasana's boat, it invigorates the belly and captivates, tap, cultivates tapas, aiding tamasika mind and kapha body. Okay, so there are three postures that would be good for obesity. Obese, what if you're talking very fat person? I'll tell you about another client. I had client 330 pounds. He's 5'10". Well, he's not 330 pounds anymore. He's 185 pounds. Now, what did I do with him at first? First, I did legs up the wall with the legs wide because that's all he could do. Very big. It was very difficult for him to even do Navasana, boat, even in the modified version. So I had to work very slowly to do boat in the modified version in the Arda Navasana, the half boat. And then I worked up to power boat. If we have a, a workshop one day, I'll show you power boat. It's a lot of fun. You use Kapavalati breathing with it. And it really churns up uh, the heat in the belly. We did it in our cleansing uh, Panchakarma workshop that we had a while ago. Okay. So there's another factor we'll want to look or with Agni and additional postures we'll want to focus on. We'll want to remember that the thyroid gland, the thyroid gland is an important part of metabolism. It's a butterfly-shaped gland in the front of the trachea in the neck. The main function of the thyroid is to control our metabolism. The thyroid helps maintain just our Agni. I heard someone say that think of um, the thyroid kind of as the, the, um, the wind or the bellow behind the, um, the fire. You know how a, a firesmith or someone who works with iron or, or uh, steel will kind of have to pump air into the fire with this big handheld thing? As that's kind of what the thyroid can be thought of. That's how it um, provides uh, function or energy, so to speak, to Jatharagni or helps Jatharagni. So even a small increase in the thyroid function will increase the appetite resulting in excess food intake, or in the case of hypothyroidism, hypothyroidism decreased food intake. The thyroid gland is stimulated by the brain's response to stress and is responsible for the release of hormones to maintain mental balance as well. The Hatha Yoga Pratapika, chapter 3, verse 79 says, the practice of sarvangasana increases jatharagni of a regular practitioner. One who practices it daily should eat ample food. If he eats insufficient food, the increasing fire soon consumes the body. What's beautiful about the shoulder stand is this can be done by pretty much everyone. Now listen, does that mean they have to go into a full shoulder stand? No. The legs up the wall is perfectly fine with this one. Can they use uh, props? Yes, Nicole. They can use props with this one. Why? Because we're not compromising the neck or the positioning of the posture, thereby compromising the effects of the posture. Any props that you would use for the shoulder stand would actually aid the stimulus of the thyroid and the pituitary. 
So in this case, using uh, props would be a fine, a fine thing for the practitioner. Okay. Sarvangasana is the ideal asana for imbalanced thyroid function. If the thyroid is overactive, the asana will cause the thyroid to reduce secretion of hormones. And the beautiful thing is, if the thyroid is underactive, the asana will trigger the thyroid to release more hormones. The general health and function of the gland is improved by consistent practice of sarvangasana. Thus, it improves metabolism and agni. So, all twists, forward bends, sideways bends, benefit the digestive system. Remember to choose your poses wisely and those that are specific to the individual, your client. These asanas put physical pressure on the abdomen and gently massage the digestive organs. Inversions like sarvangasanas help improve the health and function of the thyroid, thus improving metabolism. Does it have to be sarvangasana? No, it can be any inversion. Now, what does inversion mean? It doesn't mean you have to do a headstand, a handstand, or the peacock, mayurasana. It just means that the legs can have to be higher than the head. So there again, I'll go back to Dvipada, Viparita Karani. Perfect for everyone. Legs up the wall pose. Everyone can do it. No need for props. No need for someone getting hurt. It's perfect and still gives the benefits of the inversions. And pranayama is relaxing and has a therapeutic effect on digestion. Digestion is most effective when we are calm and the parasympathetic nervous system is predominant. Now, pranayama will be the focus of our next lecture. I think you're going to enjoy it quite a bit, but I'll ask now if there are any questions in general on asana. That was a lot of lectures on asana. There was three lectures. And remember, we want to come out of yoga therapy different than when we went in. We want to know which texts are the prominent texts for reference. And also, we want to use these texts for these books, these ancient books, as kind of um, ammunition. <laughs> you know, we want to have an authority backing us. Remember, yoga therapy is a good layperson journal. But for the professional, we want to use things that are embedded in history and ancient, um, ancient tradition. And so it wouldn't be so convincing if, if I told Bill, you know, Kapabalati is going to be good for your, your belly. I read it in a yoga journal. He's going to say, what kind of a, you know, lay person do I have coming into my home? I want a professional. Instead, I go in and I say, ancient texts from time past have said, you know, Iyengar in, in light on pranayama has said, uh, the Hatha Yoga Pratapika 15th century text has said, this gives our message weight and we must use this uh, as we move forward as professionals. Any questions? Any feedback? I want to mention someone um, was very good. I answered on the forum about uh, one of the postures. And they used the posture and then said it was Bhattakanasana, the bound wide angle, bottom of the feet together with the knees wide. And they were very good in mentioning how Iyengar says, well, this posture is good for, and it listed all the reasons why it was good for Apanavayu, right? One of the things Iyengar says is it's good for sciatic relief. And my response was, be careful. Yes, we want to take these ancient sages and, te and texts, but we also want to use our good uh, intuition and our own knowledge, our, our own discernment. We just don't want to take things just because someone said it. We really want to think about it. 
And when we think about it, we process it in a way that it makes more sense and more meaning. And either the old ancient text words become our words and we have more, more umph behind it, or we have a valid reason why the text may not work for us. Not everything will work for every yoga therapist or every um, client. So you have to start looking at these, te at these texts with a discerning eye. So what do I mean? Well, Bhattakanasana is an external hip rotator. What does that mean? It takes the knee away from the line of the body, away from the midline of the body. The outside portion of your hip is contracting. The muscles are shortening. There are six muscles, and we'll do a little anatomy in future classes. But right for today, just know there are six muscles on the outer part of your hip. One of them is called the piriformis. This muscle is mainly responsible for the sciatic, sciatica. It's a little muscle, it's an external hip rotator, and it and it ends, it goes right over the middle of the tush. <laughs> and it's and it and it creates havoc because it presses on the sciatic nerve, and this is what causes the symptoms of the radiating down the leg and pain in the back and so forth. But this is in case, of course, a person doesn't have a um, herniated disc or so forth. But 80% of sciatica can be relieved by just stretching out the piriformis. Now I'm thinking to myself, if the piriformis, when I'm looking at Iyengar's light on Pranayama book, I'm thinking, if the piriformis, if that, or excuse me, not piriformis, the psoas, if it, if it externally rotates and it contracts, how is that going to relieve the tension? Now, I'm going to give you this. Iyengar knows better than I. And he knows better whether it will provide relief. And sometimes even the great sages will give something that may not intuitively be right, but it works. Why? Because I believe they have this special power, so to speak, for healing. But I don't have that special power. I might develop it. So for now, I'm going to have to use my intuition and my, um, knowledge about anatomy and say, mm, I'm not so sure Bhattakanasana is going to work. Cow will work, Gomukasana, Ekapada Rajakapatasana, the pigeon, those will work. Why? Because they stretch the external hip rotators. And those external hip rotators are the ones that are causing the stress on sciatica nerve. So that's just kind of a little bit of a tangent to say that I want to give you information and I want to give you resources that are specific to yoga therapy. But just be really discerning about how you take in this information. Know that it isn't the word end all, that you have to experience it yourself. Now, the person who wrote the Hatha Yoga Pratapika, the text I use today, many of the things in this book are from his own yogic experiences. So maybe you write a book about your yogic experiences. So you'll have to uh, write this book from a discerning mind. So of utmost importance, be discerning about the information that you take in and then let it move through you and become you. And then maybe that wonderful healing essence of sages past will move into you as well. And then you become a healer with this wonderful power. But it won't happen if you don't think and process and let it move through you, okay? So inner knowledge is very important, yes. Any questions? I went on there. This time I'll, I'll be quiet for about 30 seconds and let you chime in if you'd like to. Any response? Now, people were asking about uh, any assignments. Assignments will be assigned um, 
at uh, different times dependent on the administrator, Manjulali's, uh, ideas on when an, an assignment should be assigned. I'm going to rely mostly on forums for uh, discerning than, than um, any other methods. That's just for me as your teacher. In the end, I may give a small test, but it won't be anything that we haven't reviewed, uh, you know, just concepts like what is an asana, what is, you know, vinyasa, what is, you know, those types of things. So other than that, just make certain to stay connected on the forum and uh, that'll be where we meet next. For now, I'd like you to gaze at the flames and connect with this powerful energy, Agni. See if you can allow a sense of warmth to develop in your low belly. Now as you feel this warmth, remember so if you begin to Feel this warmth in your low belly. Remember, it isn't a